Hello and welcome to this edition of Access Asia. Coming up, more than 70 years after being torn apart by war, aging Koreans hope family on both sides of the border may be reunited before they die. Going beyond the numbers, we look at why Singapore children excel in math and how the textbooks are being exported around the world. In China, cracks down on RAF. Beijing's discouraging artists who promote non-communist party values. We'll see how rappers are responding. But first, the freezing temperatures at the Winter Olympics in South Korea could not stop a thaw in relations with the North. But what will it mean beyond the Games? Thousands of families were torn apart when the peninsula was divided in two at the end of the Second World War. As they grow older, many wonder if they will ever see their families again. Brian Quinn reports. A cold wind blows as Kim Jong-uk, 87 years old, is helped up the steps by his daughter. From the top of this observatory, he can see North Korea, the country of his birth. His past is there beyond the border. So is his brother. He lives behind that mountain in a remote village. Just a few kilometers stand between them, but Kim Jong-uk doesn't even know if his brother is still alive. Crossing this bridge is impossible, as the two Koreas remain officially at war. That's the terrible reality of Korea. It makes me sad, because all I can do is look. June of 1950, war breaks out on the Korean peninsula. Three years of fighting end with a country split in half on either side of the 38th parallel. In the midst of the chaos, Kim Jong-uk flees southward to avoid fighting in the army of North Korea's dictator. His brother drafted into the communist army. When I left, I thought I would come back someday. But when I think about it now, I realize I left my parents, I left my family, I ran away without them. How could I do that just for my own survival? Ten years ago, a glimmer of hope. Kim Jong-uk was to see his brother again. He had been chosen, along with these families, for a rare reunion. They occur from time to time when tensions between the two Koreas ebb. An emotional moment. It was at one of these tables that Kim saw his brother. These are the photos of their reunion. When I arrived in the room, they were already there. No one guided us to them, but I recognized them straight away. That's the power of family. It's stronger than anything. Kim Jong-uk was lucky. He had been selected at random by the Red Cross from among thousands of candidates. The selection is made by a computer, to be more fair. But there are criteria, like the family bond and the age of the candidates. The older they are, the higher their priority. The family reunions are closely watched by North Korean security, and they are painfully brief. Just 12 hours to make up for the trauma of 60 years of separation. From his reunion, the old man keeps a precious gift, a photo of his parents whose old age he didn't get to see. That's my mother. We have the same ears. And that's my father. How I thank my little brother for bringing me this. All the money in the world would be nothing compared to this precious gift. Along the border, separated families often come to hang these ribbons. Messages of peace and hope for reunification. Even if relations between the two Koreas are difficult today, I'm convinced that reunification will happen eventually. That's why I need to stay alive. (laughs) The first reunions of families separated by the border took place in 1985. Since that date, only 20 such meetings have taken place. Today, There are some 59,000 South Koreans who hope to one day see their loved ones again. Mathematics may well be the universal language, but Singaporean textbooks are being translated around the world because of how well they teach it. France, among the latest to express an interest, the approach relies on using visual means to help relate numeracy to everyday life, such as learning fractions by counting fruit. Charles Pelgrin has a story. Good afternoon, kids. Welcome to the class. 
The first graders in this small private school are starting their math class with a real-life problem. John has six orange. To help the students solve this problem, the teacher isn't using her blackboard or her manual. She's giving the kids small magnets. What it meant in this sentence is, I will have three more extra than John. Six and four, is it nine? This is the part of the process referred to as concrete learning, where mathematical ideas spring up while the children are having fun. Maths is an abstract, like the question is very abstract. Then this is the way of to break down the questions by using the concrete and the pictorial. The process is repeated again and again until the students have fully absorbed the four types of operations. And if they need to, the teachers can go even further. They use everyday objects, like this pack of salt. 25 grams. Wow, that's good. So this is confirm, uh, this yeah. box is 25 grams. Okay. The second stage is visual learning. Instead of objects, drawings and diagrams are used. Two. These 12-year-olds can solve equations with two unknown variables thanks to what they call models. 3 twelfth of Jason, that means there's three parts. Does it make sense? Then, once all the concepts have been fully understood, the students start using abstract mathematical symbols like algebra. This French student came to Singapore five years ago. She had to take private classes to catch up. And now she actually likes math class. It's more of an exchange between the students and the professor here. So it's like a conversation. Singapore was at the bottom of the rankings for maths in 1990. Now the city state is either first or second every year. Its teaching method is used in dozens of countries around the world. Last year in China, a hit reality show brought rap from the underground into the spotlight. In the process, it created overnight stars in a multi-million dollar industry. But now officials have changed their tune after allegations that the genre is sexist and decadent. Shona Bhattacharya explains. It's not technically a ban. It's more like a firm suggestion from the Chinese government. Faced with the growing popularity of rap and hip-hop, authorities last month sent out a recommendation for TV shows to stop inviting guests who promote non-communist party values. The state media regulator specifically named hip-hop cultures and tattoos. Rap and hip-hop have long been an underground phenomenon in China, but recent TV and online shows have helped it enter the mainstream. Nagi is a popular hip-hop artist. He believes the genre will prevail in the end. I think it's, it's going to be a short period. After that, hip-hop will keep on moving. But now it's a hard time for us. Musicians and rappers are also being told to watch their language. State media prohibit lyrics promoting misogyny and drug use. Artists like Mr. Trouble argue those themes made their music appealing. <laughs> Authorities will remove any song guilty of promoting non-party values from online streaming sites. Rappers like Mr. Trouble have no choice but to play by the government's rules. I think you should be smart. You should be smart. You, you gotta be a smart person. Even my album is soft and weak, but it's a hip-hop album. I put my attitude in it. If you're smart as me, you can know it. You can dig it out. Chinese authorities have long tried to promote a particular vision of national culture. They target so-called nefarious outside influences. Despite their efforts, it looks unlikely they'll be able to stem the global wave of hip-hop. <laughs> Well, it's a year of the dog in China. People born under the zodiac sign include Madonna, Mother Teresa, Winston Churchill, Michael Jackson, and Donald Trump. But the most celebrated canine in China is the Pekingese. It was named after the capital. The breed, a luxury that could only be enjoyed by China's royal family. Its popularity surged in the 1990s, but today they're hard to find. Francois Weibo has more. For centuries, the tiny Pekingese lived in the imperial palace as the lapdogs of China's royal family. 
But after the revolution, the dog named after the capital city was made available to the masses. Their mannerisms just captivated me. They have an aristocratic way of carrying themselves. However, the Pekingese soon became a victim of its own popularity. By the 1990s, the streets were teeming with short-legged strays, which meant that they mixed with other dogs and diluted their unique characteristics. At that time, the number of these dogs grew too big very suddenly. A lot of pet owners turned to foreign breeds and abandoned them. Many of them switched to other breeds. The drop in demand means that today very few kennels still breed Pekingese. So now dog lovers seeking the purest pups must look abroad. There are no good ones in China. In the early 90s, there were some foreign breeds that gradually entered China. So now if you want high-quality Pekingese, you have to buy them abroad. But so-called high-quality dogs result from generations of inbreeding that often reduces intelligence. They're not smart dogs. They're ugly and stupid. Just something to keep in mind when you're saving up thousands of euros to buy a designer dog. And finally, a Japanese artist is turning fallen cat fur into a feline fashion accessory. Hiromi Yamazaki creates wigs for her pets, introducing the Trump. She said recreating the U.S. president's likeness, though, is difficult because his hair seems to look different in every photograph. Hiromi's husband, Ryo, takes pictures for their Instagram account, which has well over 800,000 followers. The cats also model sushi and hats. Warmer weather around the corner. The feline should be shedding soon, too. So expect a new spring collection out anytime. We'll leave you with these images. Thanks for watching. Please stay tuned to France 24.